Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Confluence Festival of India in Australia. We are delighted to introduce our literature component, Words on Water, for the first time in Mandra, produced by Teamwork Arts and Writing WA. And a very special thank you um, to MAMPAC for hosting us. Um, in a moment, I've got a few special thank yous to give, but before I do so, I'd like to just give an acknowledgement of country um, to the land on which we meet today, the land of the Binjara people of the Bibbulmun Nation, a land that is rich with story, both ancient and new. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders and storytellers past, present and emerging. This area was originally known as Manju Gurabdup, which translate as meeting place of the heart. Given that writers often tell stories from the heart, it seems appropriate that we're gathering here today for words on water. We have a few thank yous to give. To the Consulate General of India, Perth, um, to the Festival Advisor, Mr Yaz Mubaraki, MLA, to the Perth Theatre Trust, Saraswati Mad Madhvadya, my apologies, Mahavidya Laya, the Ministry of Culture, the City of Mandra, Mandra Performing Arts Centre, Writing WA and Visit Mandra. Just a few little note, housekeeping notes. Please do not leave your bags unattended as the festival is unable to take responsibility for any loss and there is no flash photography permitted in the venue. The venue has a number of exit points, that being the main one. Um, and the toilets, if you need them, are straight out the door and just down the corridor to your right. So welcome to our first session of today's program. Taruzism's Shashi Taro in conversation with Stephen Smith. Shashi Taror is an award-winning author of 18 books of fiction and non-fiction, including the great Indian novel, An Era of Darkness, The British Empire in India, and the recently published The Paradoxical Prime Minister. He has won numerous literary awards, including a Commonwealth Writers' Prize and a Crossword Lifetime Achievement Award. A third-term Member of Parliament representing Triv Trivandrum, Dr. Taror has served as Minister of State in the Government of India and also served as Under Secretary General of the United Nations during Kofi Annan's tenure as head. He will be in conversation with Stephen Smith, who has been a Professor of Public International Law at the University of Western Australia since 2014. Stephen was a Federal Member for Perth for the Australian Labor Party from 1993 until 2013. In a distinguished career spanning 20 years in the Australian Federal Parliament, he has served as the Minister for Defence and prior to that as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Trade. Please welcome Dr Taror and Stephen Smith. as well okay. there <laughs> and lots of you. Okay. <laughs> I just grab those. Uh, well welcome everyone. Thanks very much for attending. You can tell that we've carefully rehearsed the opening bits. <laughs> 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 well Sashi, um, we last uh, met each other in Delhi in 2009 or 2010 when um, there was an issue in the Australia-India diplomatic relationship where to put it crassly in Australian terms, too many Australians were beating up too many Indians on Melbourne trains. 
Um, Mind you, the Indian media made far too much of it too, so there was that hysteria we had to deal with. There's an element of that, but we both had to deal with that. But if you'd asked me at the time, where do you think we'll next meet, then Mandra would have been very low on my list. (laughs) It wouldn't have been on my list at all because I'd never heard of it (laughs) until I got here, and it's beautiful. Well, it's it's a terrific part of, 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 of Perth. It's also got a great history in more recent times of attracting significant performing arts and cultural events, and that's reflected by the audience today, but also the, the, the surrounding infrastructure. But I, I, I want to start by, w- our theme is words on, words on water. Let's start with words. Now, you've had a stellar career. So you, you have a, 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 a UN uh, career at very high levels, and I'll come back to that. You're then a minister uh, in the Monmouth Singh government for, for external affairs. You're now a member of parliament, but in the midst of all of that, somehow you've managed to write book after book, article after article, voluminous publications. And from my personal perspective, I've always found writing the hardest thing to do, the most time-consuming, the most sort of assiduous. How have you managed over a stellar career in three or four different guises to write so much, but also to write so well and so interestingly? You're too kind. I think actually the best answer to that was given by an American humorist in the 1940s, A.J. Liebling, who said, I write faster than anybody who writes better, and I write better than anybody who writes faster. <laughs> so that's, that's, that was actually, I, in some ways, become a sort of motto of mine. I, I, I do, I, I treat writing as an escape from the daily chores, and, and the daily chores, as you rightly surmise, have been extremely demanding, uh, both in Indian politics and in the United Nations. And so um, it's sort of something I, I, I escape to, as it were, sort of take my soul and park it somewhere else for maybe two or three hours a day. Uh, yeah. Very often, unfortunately, late at night, and I never was a night owl. I was an early morning guy in university. But I trained myself because, you know, by the time all the demands have petered out and people are no longer knocking at the door or ringing your phone, that's when you have the the, the chance to be alone with your thoughts and, and put them down on, on the computer screen. Yeah. Okay, so I should go back to Perth and tell my wife that if we stopped walking around the river for an hour each night and I devoted that to writing, I'd be better off. <laughs> I, I would not <laughs> recommend that course of action, no. <laughs> okay, let's just go back to so your UN career. So Australia and India, have, from a foreign policy perspective, have both been strong supporters of multilateralism and the UN. And you got to essentially two IC. So you worked as a as a deputy uh, undersecretary to uh, Kofi Annan, and you were a strong candidate for his replacement. And putting it in diplomatic terms, a, a P5 veto occurred. That's code for one of the permanent five said no. That candidate. it's no secret which it was. Uh, no, I'm not, it was I'm, the Bush I'm, administration. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to I'm coming to that. <laughs> the the audience here is a literary audience. We're giving them a quick sort of update on, right. on on foreign policy. So you were vetoed by the second Bush administration. Now, when you look back at that, do you regret that? Do you do you see that as being a, a, a major lost or missed opportunity in in your career, or did, did you adopt your own advice, as you've written and said on numerous occasions, one should forgive but not forget when one is looking back, because if you look back without forgiving, then the danger is your own personal rancour and discomfort consumes you and, and stops you doing things in the future. So how do you reflect upon that sort of mischance or loss opportunity? Or well, I mean, uh, actually, at several levels, uh, at perhaps the most instant or superficial level, Yes, I mean, obviously, I was extremely um, uh, disappointed by the outcome. Uh, it was close, but no cigar. I was two votes shy of Ban Ki-moon in the first uh, ballot. But when the fourth ballot had different colored ballot paper for the permanent members, and we realized that there were two negative votes, of which one was from a permanent member. That's tantamount to veto. And at that point, uh, since Ban had no permanent members voting against him, um, I felt the right thing to do was to step aside. But because... When I was invited to contest, I began to persuade myself that my entire life's work at the UN uh, had been a preparation for this moment. Uh, It seemed somehow as if um, uh, something that I had almost felt uh, destined to get, as it were, had been taken away. So at that level, there was a a crushing disappointment. What sustained me in many ways was um, was a lesson I'd imbibed from the Bhagavad Gita, the the great... uh, work of Hindu philosophy, scripture, and religion. 
which essentially says that uh, you have to do the right thing regardless of the outcome. In other words, do your duty, do what you feel is necessary to do without worrying too much about the fruits of it and the consequences of it. It's a difficult lesson to imbibe. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is actually uh, said to be recited by Lord Krishna to Arjuna, the great warrior, who contemplates a battle in which he'll have to kill a lot of his childhood friends, cousins, relatives. Um, and and he, he is torn by doubt. I mean, can this be the right thing to do? And Krishna talks about dharma, the right duty, and so on. Uh, and uh, when you pitch it at that level of abstraction, you don't quite relate it to your own life. But then you have something like this, where you kind of pour yourself heart and soul for a while. I, I took leave from the UN to campaign so that I wouldn't be seen as any sort of conflict of interest, so I hadn't been paid for several months. Uh, it, it was a, a serious commitment to make. Um, and then suddenly there I was, um, you know, not only having failed to, to win that race, but also feeling that the, uh, the efforts I had made um, up to that point uh, to have a widely seen as stellar UN career uh, were now prematurely ending, because after all, I, I ended up uh, leaving the UN at 51, which, uh, which uh, was, was a, at least a decade, if not more, earlier than I expected to have to do so. So there was this challenge to reinvent one's life. Uh, I didn't wallow in it. The moment had come. It had gone a certain way. And I was sort of philosophical enough to accept that there would be uh, other opportunities presenting themselves over the next uh, couple of days. And in the, in the couple of, in fact, it took me about two years to transition fully into Indian politics. I dabbled in and out of India for a while, just testing the waters, seeing what the prospects were. Uh, but in the end, I think in some ways that defeat nonetheless gave me a, an amount of prominence and visibility in India, which I would not normally have expected to have as a, a UN official sitting in New York that in turn prepared the ground for the following I have in the country and, and, the, and the political career becoming possible. Yeah. Well, I think good, good advice about how you should conduct yourself personally and in public, particularly in university, you can find from the Bhagavad Gita or you can get from my mum who always used to say, it doesn't matter what happens, you should always be dressed appropriately, you should conduct yourself in public with civility and dignity and everything else will follow from that. She always used to say, you know, things happen for a reason. So if you don't get this or don't get that, then, then there's a reason why that occurs. But if you do conduct yourself appropriately as you did on that occasion, then other th opportunities open up. So what opened up for you was the chance to be a minister in the Indian government. And I had the great privilege of dealing not just with Indian foreign and defence ministers, but I also met on a number of occasions with your Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh. Now, I thought he was a great Prime Minister. I thought he was a, 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 a great man. And I think his record of achievement as a minister, a senior minister, he was foreign minister as well, as you know. Uh, finance and as, minister as well. And finance as well. Uh, uh, that his achievement as a public figure in India is underappreciated, and I regard him very, very highly. You were, had the chance to actually work with him essentially on a day-to-day -day basis. What's your view of him, and how did you find him as an individual? Oh, I, I, you know, he said in his uh, last uh, weeks in office, I think history will judge me more kindly than you do to the press. Uh, and uh, That's and always the case. It is, and Partic it's partic already... Particularly in Australia. Yeah, I, I don't think he expected <laughs> to see history being written quite as fast, because uh, it's already being said widely. Uh, the entire tone of the, the social uh, um, uh, media memes, for example, which used to lampoon him mercilessly when he was in office, I mean, the joke was uh, when you had to turn your mobile phone on silent, some smart alecky compare would come up and say, please put your phones on Manmohan Singh mode, you know, that kind of joke. Uh, and it's all changed. It's all changed. Now it's, this is the wise man who did so much good for the economy, did so much good for the country, who was underappreciated in his time. That's now become the dominant trope. And I think it's, it's right. I think he really was an extraordinarily effective prime minister. In fact, during the the lead up to the elections of 2014 that unseated him, I was invited by the BBC to do a piece arguing, it was part of a debate, arguing about his, um, his accomplishments. And it's still there. I urge you to Google me and the BBC and Manmohan Singh, you'll find it. But I think, it, I think the point is that there's an enormous amount, principally on the economic front, but not only, yeah. because he also had a lot to do with India's stature on the global stage, 
uh, India's ability to be taken seriously around the world. And it's striking that Obama, in his first year or two uh, as president, was, was uh, uh, asked to give an interview. Sorry, it was towards the end of his first term as president, was asked in an interview, who are the world leaders you've interacted with, who have impressed you the most? And the first name he instantly came up with was Manmohan Singh. Now, that's a huge credit to India, and, and I think that people are, are realizing now what they've lost in, a, in an environment in which our economy is in a shambles, uh, and where everything else that, see, that could be going wrong seems to be going wrong as a result of willful decisions being taken by those in power. So there's no question that, um, that Manmohan Singh was, uh, was, was, uh, was, has left a, a significant legacy. He's also a, a much more cerebral person than one is accustomed to in politics. Um, he was unusual in being an upper house prime minister, uh, which in our system is permissible. Um, and you know, those of us who had to fight the harder way of getting elected by people uh, know that it involves a lot of dumbing down of one's uh, approaches, as well as a certain amount of, of retail politics that would not have come easily to a man like him. Um, but by, in a sense, avoiding that and, and coming in, our, our upper house is elected by state assemblies, yes. so essentially the party gets you elected. Yes. Uh, by avoiding that and coming in that way, Manmohan Singh also was able to take the, the larger view. He was able to see the wood rather than the trees, and that made him an astonishingly effective big picture prime minister. Yeah. Well, this would, this would the fact that he was in the upper house and not in the Lok Sabha, uh, as you are, uh, will be interesting to a Western Australian and Australian audience because in our state legislatures, you have to be in the lower house, mm -hmm. the Legislative Assembly, to become the Premier. That is and, the British custom. Yeah, yeah. And, in the, and in the Australian Parliament, you have to be a member of the House of Reps, as I was, to, be, to become Prime Minister. So the fact that you know, half a dozen or so Indian Prime Ministers have come from what we'd call the Senate or the Legislative Council is is counterintuitive from our perspective, but it's worked very well for your system. See, there was never a constitutional requirement. The British do everything because of unspoken tradition and you know, accumulation of practice, but it, it's obviously completely set in stone. I mean, there's no way that somebody in the upper house could be prime minister, even, there, even though there's nothing written in the law that prohibits it. Yeah. Whereas in India, though it's not written in the law, for the first few decades, the assumption was it would be a lower house person. And then one day suddenly, um, and I've forgotten which one it was, I think it may have been Mr. Deva Gowda, um, uh, became prime minister. It was uh, at a time when a complicated coalition was patched together. He had not even been a candidate for the federal parliament. He'd been elected in his own state. So he had to be accommodated quickly in the House, but he was seen as the most acceptable consensus candidate. And so they got him elected by his state assembly to the upper house and made him prime minister, which... Um, um, as everyone pointed out at the time, is not explicitly barred by any piece of legislation or by the Constitution. And once the precedent is set, as you know, in politics, others promptly step into the breach and follow it. So there have been not half a dozen, but I think three or four. Yeah. Well, let me come to The British, which has been one of your more recent uh, books and one which has had a significant impact. Well, let me firstly start with an anecdote. So I, I'm in Delhi, I'm at the Khan Markets, and I'm in a bookshop with a professional colleague. And uh, I walk in and I say to the, to, the, to, the, to the bookstore owner, who's sort of, you know, hiding behind a, a, a stack of books. The stack of books is about a metre and a half high. He's, he's you know, five foot two. Uh, and I say, I want, uh, I want um, uh, Shivshanka Menon's most recent book and I want the first two volumes of, of uh, Pranab Mukherjee's autobiography. My colleague says, look, um, I, I, I don't know who wrote it and I, and I don't know what the title is, but the cover's red, uh, and it's about how terrible the British were. <laughs> and so, and so, so the, books, the bookseller comes out from behind the stack of books, gets a ladder, goes up to the third last shelf, finds the fifth, fifth last book in the stack, pulls it out, hands it over, and of course it's, it's your book. Uh -huh. So when I go to, um, to Delhi, which I pretty much I have, you know, I did went almost every year when I was a minister, and other than a, g a gap, I've gone back one or tw once or twice, sort of, um, for the last half dozen years. I love to go and stand and look at the North Block and the South Block, turn around, see see the the, 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 the Gate of India, and I look at the North Block and the South Block. I say, the British built these in the 40s. They had no intention of leaving. They weren't going anywhere. Very true. And so, so I, I know you've said publicly and in in your writings you know, they were exhausted by World War II and had no choice but to extract themselves. But they didn't want to leave under any circumstances. So in the end, 
what do you think caused them to go? Was it just exhaustion of the war or the realisation that a once great empire was now much more circumscribed? I, I think it was, there was always a multiplicity of factors, but the wartime exhaustion had a lot to do with it because England entered the war not just broke, but heavily in debt to the US and even to India and to other countries. Um, and meanwhile, with the, uh, the, the Gandhian uh, civil disobedience movement having reached its peak, the Quit India movement in 1942 that uh, saw the British throwing the entire Congress party leadership and many of the workers and organizers into jails, um, the the uh, rebellion of some Indian soldiers who had been taken prisoner by the Japanese uh, who created the Indian National Army and fought against the British, which for the first time was a serious uh, revolt within the ranks of the British Indian Army. Um, and then the Royal Indian Navy mutiny in which um, the sailors actually turned the cannons on these British Indian ships onto the port of Bombay and, 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 and caused a few casualties shelling cannonballs into the port. Uh, all of this made Britain realize that with the mounting disorder in the country, they were only going to be able to retain their hold on power by sending in a heck of a lot more troops in order to keep the peace, which they had neither the men nor the money to do. So I think it was uh, a choice of either you'd sort of double down or you fold, the gambler's choice. And I think given the fact that Attlee had just won the 45 election, on a platform focusing Britain much more on its domestic needs, promising a national health service, uh, workers' uh, compensation, so on and so forth. The last thing he was going to be in a position to do was to actually expand uh, his presence in the colonies, and particularly in India. So at the end of all of that, I think it was all these factors, domestic developments in India, the exhaustion of the war, the financial situation, rationing was crippling England, the election of a Labour government with a domestic focus, all of this uh, meant that there was no other rational choice and certainly the idea of continuing was not there. Of course, people like Winston Churchill fought bitterly uh, to the end against the decision to withdraw, but they really <coughs> would not have been able yeah. to justify it in terms of economic policy terms. Well, Attlee's campaign, if, you, if, you, if you're interested in politics and parliaments and governments as you and I are, if you look back at Attlee's campaign, it was really one of the all-time great campaigns in, a, in, a, in the modern jargon, we say, in a narrative sense. So I've got at home sort of Attlee's great poster and now win the peace, which was his essential thematic, which is Winston's won the war, now we've got to win the peace. And this great poster, which was given to me by the Labor Party when I finished a particular job in that campaign, which is just a, 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 a picture of a a mother holding a child, and the slogan is "Mothers Vote Labor." Now, who, how could you, how could you not win? So it was a great campaigning effort by Attlee, but it would have been completely different with Churchill. And so the election—it's that old slogan that the election of a government can sometimes change a country. In, in this case, it changed too, because independence would not have been easily granted under Churchill. Yeah, it would not have been granted by Churchill, but he would also have have been presiding over a shambles because he wouldn't have had the resources to send the yeah. reinforcements necessary yeah. to hold India that yeah. firmly. There's a World War I connection between Australia and India, as you might be aware, mm -hmm. but some of our audience might not. When you go to Gallipoli, uh, which is the scene of um, one of Churchill's great debacles... Uh, one of many, I might yeah. add, but we tend to brush those under the carpet. Um, you, you go to... If you're an Australian minister or visitor, you go to the Australian Memorial at Lone Pine, you go to the New Zealand uh, Memorial, but if you actually spend more time, there's also an Indian Memorial, yes. because the Indians fought shoulder to shoulder with the Australians That's right. and the New Zealanders at Gallipoli. Uh, and it's a very impressive memorial, and it does, it causes you to contemplate the India-Australia relationship, which is of much longer standing than people give it credit for. And so, my first contact with uh, Indian culture and Indian society was with the post-World War I, pre-World War II Indian, uh, Anglo-Indian migration to Australia and Western Australia. And I think you're on record as saying the British left behind two or three things that were worth, worth, worth their while. Tea, uh, cricket, uh, a railway system that Indians could then run better, <laughs> um, but you'd, or more you'd, equitably, anyway. or more equitably. But you, but you. So the the, the freight subsidisation of British freight uh, was always cross subsidised by the cost to Indian travellers. 
Um, but you never mentioned hockey. So one of the great things which the British left behind was hockey. Because when the Anglo-Indians came to Australia, they played hockey and coached hockey. So my first hockey coach was an Anglo-Indian. And it's really been that influence which has seen Australian men and women hockey be of world class and multiple winners of World Cups and Olympic Games and the like. That's right. I remember uh, there was an Anglo-Indian boy in school in Calcutta a couple of years senior for me who um, was allowed to come into Australia despite your white Australia policy because he was, um, he was uh, a star hockey player. And I think he ended up playing for Australia at some level uh, in the hockey chap called, I think, Eugene Jennings. So there, there, there were Anglo-Indians uh, associated with hockey both in India and, and in Australia yeah. at roughly the same yeah. time. But of course, your, your immigration policies of the day didn't make close contact very easy. We did send uh, a test cricketer who had scored a debut, uh, a debut ton against Australia, K.S. Dalip Sinji, as our first high commissioner. So, you know, us Indians knew, we thought, how to get on the Australian's wavelength. Yeah. But I think it's taken well, us a few decades <coughs> to get to where Stephen Smith brought it. Well, at the time, the other Stephen Smith. Um, <laughs> and the other Stephen Smith as well. <laughs> at the time you got your independence, our migration policy, which was before the Citizenship Act, which, which Prime Minister Chifley put through, you were, you were one of two things. You were a British subject or you were an alien. And so the Anglo-Indians would have got in potentially on, uh, under the notion of being a British subject. But that was the way in which from Federation in 1901 until the Citizenship Act of 1947-48, we described you were either a British subject or you were an alien. You know, so there were plenty of people who were, who were aliens. But let me just fast forward to the modern Australia-India relationship. So... Um, when I was both foreign and defence minister, I'd go to India regularly and I'd try and encourage a greater uh, step up in the relationship at every level, trade, investment, strategic, political defence with India. Um, and India was not really ready for that, for that step up. It is now, and uh, I think that's largely as a result of the geostrategic shifting plates. So when I was still a minister, Australia worked out that by the time we got to 2050, the top four economies would be probably, probably in this order, China, India, United States and Indonesia. So we said, well, we've got to try and grow our relationship with India and Indonesia. Not that we hadn't been trying for, for decades, but the real weakness has been the trade and investment relationship. That's right. So we have more Australian investment into minerals resources in Africa than we do investment in India. Uh, and despite decades of trying with both India and Indonesia. Indonesia, for example, is outside our top 10 trading partners, which is perverse given the proximity and the importance. So how do you see now the potential for an enhanced Australia-India relationship? We talk about the Indo-Pacific, which is essentially, in the modern era, you can't have a reference point without India because India is on the rise as a great power. Last time I was in Delhi and Mumbai in September, there was a greater receptiveness to the relationship than ever before. Enthusiasm, looking at the potential. Um, but what's your own analysis about how bilaterally we sit now and into the future? Well, I mean, the problem with India, I think, uh, and I say this not as an opposition politician, but also somebody who's written a couple of books about India's policy in the world. Um, Pax Indica, in particular, is now seven years old, so it was actually a prescription for my own government. Uh, that my, when I was out of office, which my government didn't follow, uh, but it's, it's redoubled really with the present lot, is that we seem to be doing everything you're saying very hesitantly. We take one step forward, half a step back. So uh, yes, we have become uh, much, much closer to Australia at all levels, including trade, but we have been uh, unwilling to risk the ultimate step, for example, of joining the RCEP. We have now decided not to join it. Uh, which in many ways means that we have been acting on our fears and apprehensions and our entrenched past habits and prejudices rather than our hopes and aspirations for the future. And that's something which is deeply disappointing, but it's not untypical of Indian decision-making, particularly by the bureaucracy, but also by many of the political class, which in any democracy would be forced to think in the short term. And undoubtedly, there would be short-term costs to our SEP that Mr. Modi feels he can't risk taking on right now, um, but he's throwing away a lot of long-term gains in the process. Um, similarly, you take geopolitics, as you mentioned, something like the Quad, uh, which was a, an idea that India embraced with a lot of diffidence because uh, it seemed mortally afraid of being seen by China 
as somehow part of a containment strategy against China, and therefore it was very reluctant to, um, to actually sign up. Initially, uh, India is a country that insisted that the quadrilateral countries as Australia, India, Japan, and, in, and, and the US meet only at officials level. Then India balked at a joint statement, and all four countries issued their own statements. And all the tea leave readers were, were sort of seeing which expressions in which statement didn't match in another statement, and how India initially avoided Indo-Pacific and didn't mention the mm. South China Sea Lanes and so on. I thought, my God, why do these things if you're going to do them so half-heartedly? Now, suddenly, India has agreed to have the Quad meet at the foreign minister's level, but I don't think I saw a joint communique out of that. Um, so th there's always this the sense of India will sort of, it's like dipping your toe in the water to see if it's hot enough. Uh, and, and I really think that we ought to have a much clearer strategic vision as to what we want to do, and then take the plunge wholeheartedly, which I'm afraid we have so far been unable to do. I do believe India and Australia have no real uh, conflicts, uh, and, and we ought to make common cause. I think that uh, the India that Manmohan Singh led certainly had democratic values and political convictions strongly in consonance with the other three members of the quadrilateral. Now we have both Mr. Modi and Mr. Trump throwing doubt on which values are core to these societies. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I think we obviously have much more in common with each of us than, um, than we would have had, um, uh, than we would have had, shall we say, with, um, with the Chinese. And so either we decide we're going to sort of completely surrender to the Chinese and do everything they want us to do, in which case we don't need the Quad and the Quad doesn't need us, or we decide that we feel there is a long-term strategic threat coming from there, that the best way to resist it is to have partners uh, who have certain congruent interests, and that, and that therefore if it means uh, offending the Chinese occasionally or putting their noses out of joint from time to time, so be it, we'll pay the price. Now, somehow we seem to be trying to have it both ways all the time, and that's where to my mind, we're going wrong. We have to make one or the other clear choice. Well, I think it's, look, it's a real disappointment and it's a terrible outcome that, that we've got 15 countries in the region signing up for RCEP, the regional trade agreement, without India. But I, I, mean, I expressed the view in the run-up to that that Australia should not allow that circumstance to occur, that we should work very hard to make sure India was in, even if that meant delaying the agreement. So, but I, I'm, I was clearly in a sort of minority in the Australian foreign policy community of that view because I thought the longer term strategic gains by having India in far outweigh the shorter term trade and investment gains of that trade agreement because the reality is from Australia's perspective it's just integrating free trade or, or trade agreements we have with the constituent countries anyway. We already have a trade agreement with ASEAN and the other five. Uh, India is the only one we don't. But I was pleased to see in the India press the commentary along the lines of, well, we haven't gone into that for a range of reasons, but now we can look at resuscitating the Australia-India free trade agreement conversations and we can look at resuscitating India-EU. So it's not as if there's a standstill, but it, it's a deep disappointment. Well, India-EU is going nowhere. I, I happen to have looked a little well, bit... Well, if you're that. Australian, you'd hope that's the but case India, so that Australia-India Australia could... Can, actually, there, we, there's much less fear... Um, with of Australia. Australian products swamping yeah. India than there yeah. was uh, of, of, uh, of, you know, getting a lot of stuff from the EU that, that um, would change consumption patterns in India but not being able to give enough to the EU to make it worthwhile. Yeah. Well, let's look at the things that we do share, like the values and virtues. Because I used to say when I'd go to India, you know, we, we, we're both respecters of the rule of law, we're both respecters of the law of contract, we're both parliamentary democracies. I'd also say when I go to the United States... I'd be told by colleagues in the United States, you're now in the greatest democracy in the world, and my response would be, well, that may or may not be the case, but I'm not in the largest. India is the largest democracy in the world. So we have those things in common. We have, we have cricket and we have hockey. Um, is that enough to, to see the relationship really take off, or do you need... It's enough to start building on, but I think you left out one very crucial factor, which is the extraordinary influence of the growing Indian population in well, This was my very next point. Which is that I believe you've reached 900,000 people born in India, and if you add uh, those of Indian extraction who've come here via uh, birth in Malaysia or Fiji or Kenya or whatever, you're crossing a million people in a country of, what, 25, 25 million? Yeah. So that's, that's one out of four Australians, and that's a very, very remarkable well, figure. It, it's, and I think that's the, that's the chemistry that will see the relationship grow. So I think our last census... Not one out of four, 4%, sorry. Bad mathematics early in the morning. No, no, but still, 
Yeah. But one out of 25 yeah. in a country of 25 million is a, is a big lick. That's a big impact. That's an important impact. And the Indian diaspora does and will take an interest in not just commercial matters but also in public policy and parliamentary mm -hmm. and government matters. So at the last state election here, uh, for the first time, uh, an Indian origin member of parliament was elected to our lower house, mm -hmm. um, Yaz Morabakai, who's... I met him yesterday. Yeah, he's a good I'm guy. I'm sorry he's not here. But he, um, he's a good guy. He, he's a ter terrifically impressive yeah. guy and yeah. somebody who I think will um, will really um, be potentially somebody you could have in your federal parliament. Absolutely. And such an enthusiasm for the relationship and for the people. So That's right. I think that diaspora point, the people to people contacts will really get, get, get the show moving. But even though you and I are disappointed about RCEP and there are other things that we would be disappointed about, when I was in Mumbai in September, my last visit, something's already happening because both uh, financiers in Mumbai, officials in Delhi and, uh, and Australian officials and Western Australian officials in both Delhi and Mumbai drew attention to the following stat, which is to me a killer stat. Over the preceding 12 months, both in students, tourism and investment and trade both ways, a 10% increase. So something's occurring there. There's always a lag effect, as you know, from what occurs. 10% over the previous year. Yeah, yeah, both ways. So 10% increase of your students here, our students there. 10% increase your tourists here, our tourists there. 10% increase our trade to you and your trade to us. So something's happening, albeit yeah. off, a, off a regrettably low base, but something's on the move and governments and statisticians will, will, will catch up on that, in my view. Wonderful. No, I, think, I think they will. I think, and yeah. so the potential is really in the right direction. Yeah. On the Indian economy, when I was in Mumbai, I spoke to, as you'd expect, a lot of sort of investment and financier people. It's sort of the equivalent of our, you know, Sydney or Melbourne investment community. Uh, and they were saying, look, GDP, growth of the economy is down. We attribute that to a botched implementation of the GST, the surprise decision on the cash economy which caught everyone unawares, that's clipped two or three percent of GDP, but we remain absolutely confident of the inexorable growth which will see India, you know, take its place as one of the top three or four economies sometime between 2030 and 2050. But well below potential. The problem is that India, I mean, the fundamentals are there and we are a very large economy. We just sort of make things for each other. We will grow whether we want to or not. But the kind of damage that was done by demonetization, which was a completely unnecessary self-inflicted wound, and then the hasty and botched, uh, unprepared rollout of, of the GST. The GST was a great idea. Demonetization was a bad idea implemented badly. GST was a good idea implemented badly. <laughs> but the result has been, unfortunately, that the economy uh, not only took a, a very bad beating, uh, a lot of people lost jobs. A lot of the Indian economy was in what we call small and micro enterprises. Two employees, five employees, seven employees. Many of these depended completely on cash flow. I mean, you come in in the morning, give them a job of work, pay them, and it's out of that money that they pay their workers at the end of the day. So in those circumstances, these chaps ended up simply being unable to function. They don't have the kind of capital base that they can just carry on uh, wearing the, weathering the storm for the three or four months. It took the government to print enough notes to replace the ones they'd abruptly pulled. And so the result was that many of these businesses shut down never to open again, throwing millions of people out of work. Daily wage laborers are the biggest hit. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, the government didn't pay a political price for this. They managed to shift the narrative to national security issues, terrorism, and so on, and they won re-election. But the damage they've done lingers on. Our unemployment today is at the worst levels uh, we've seen in the country in 46 years. Uh, farmers, sadly, the agricultural sector is in such distress the farmers are committing suicide in record numbers. And we're looking at a situation in which exports are down, manufacturing is down, automobile sales are down, industrial production is down. There's just a lot of bad news all over the place. And, and that's why, yes, the sheer numbers and the sheer weight of numbers may keep us uh, as the world's third largest economy in PPP terms, but we would be much below where we were expected to be and projected to be by the IMF and others um, as recently as, let's say, three or four years ago. And other than a change of government, which can't occur at the national level for another four and a half odd years, what's, what, is, what is the solution? One thing which India and Australia do have in common is that 
the state governments, and we have half a dozen, you've got, you know, 30 29, or 29, yeah. Yeah, 30 odd. Um, decisions that state governments make about local economies can have an impact. So, for example, at the moment in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, house, house prices are on the rise again, which has always been a central part, particularly of the Sydney economy, whereas here they're flat, which is a result of a downturn three or four years ago in the minerals and re minerals resources industry. So there are variations in how the economy is going in different parts of the country. So there's no prospect of a change of government f uh, for four and a half years. Uh, what's the capacity for influential and large state governments to be having an, an economic impact? Well, they'll have to. Um, and the, the irony is the BJP controls the vast majority of state governments and they've just won uh, re-election in two of them. So they're up to, I think, 20 of the 29 states uh, are in their pocket. And um, in those circumstances, uh, they very much are susceptible to direction from the center, from, from Delhi. And we'll have to see at the end of the day whether, whether with those... Um, with those um, um, uh, realities and constraints, including a, a difficulty or a disinclination to challenge centrally established policies, whether they can make the kind of difference they need to. But there's no question that some states have been doing better than others, partially because of a more congenial environment, greater incentives for investment, and so on, uh, and, and simply because historically they've been more productive economically, even, even in other times. Um, so we would expect to see some differentials there. The other thing is the central government needs to learn some lessons from its mistakes and needs to be receptive to corrective advice, whether from inside or from outside. Uh, the problem has been in recent years a certain defensiveness of approach, which has resulted, unfortunately, in, um, in, in, in some uh, somewhat insular decision-making whose consequences we're all living with. Hmm. I've been checking my clock, and I've just got the signal. We've got five minutes to go before we throw open to the audience for yes, some questions. Yes, of course, sure. So I've got, I've got two. No, we did start five minutes late, though, didn't we? Mm. That's all right. Well, well, we'll, we'll have to claim that back from we, the we audience might, time. We, yeah. we, we, might, we might pad five minutes at the end. Um, so I've got, I got, I got two questions. One is, if I was a member of parliament and I was travelling around the world, you know, giving speeches, writing books, doing this or that, in Australia, I'd be criticised for not devoting myself to my constituency. So how do you manage to be a member of parliament in Kerala, in the lower house, in the Lok Sabha, do all of the things that you do, the international commentary, the writings, etc., and still get elected, you know, with an increased majority, 10% margin at the last election? How does that work? Um, <laughs> I get my share of criticism, don't worry. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, it's partly that um, I do make it a systematic uh, policy to devote at least 10 days a month to the constituency where I'm there full time. Uh, and I maintain an office that's pretty efficient uh, to pick up yeah. uh, requests from constituents the rest of the time. Um, and even when I'm traveling, I'm always connected to the constituency. Um, and on, because of the weather we've been having lately, on my last two trips abroad, I find myself involved in rescue efforts for Trivandrum fishermen whose boats had been caught up uh, in cyclones and washed ashore where they weren't supposed to be and there was panic in their home villages, yeah. which happened to be in my constituency, and I had to make some calls and intercede and so on. So that kind of thing goes on wherever yeah. you are. So in the, modern, in the modern era, you're always... You can, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that many of my constituents seem to value that I have a reach, perhaps because of some of my international connections. I remember the amusement with which I discovered that some of my fishermen had innocently, within quotes, strayed into British territorial waters around Diego Garcia, which obviously is far, far away from their traditional fishing lands. It was very difficult for them to convincingly claim they had lost their way. And of course, the British had promptly arrested them. Uh, and the SOS comes to me as the MP. And I was able to call the British at a fairly senior level and get them uh, to make an exception to their policy and release these people and their boat, um, which uh, was not what they'd been doing earlier. And so the, the people back home are and, grateful and that because of this international kind of MP, yeah. they got something done for them. Yeah. Mind you, the same incident happened again for a different set of boats, and this time the British said, sorry, we'll release the people since you asked, but we're not going to release the boats now because they'll come right back again. So the, that became an issue. But the fact is that I do try and leverage such of my international reaches I have 
in the interests of my constituents when required. Well, two things, the British post independence, whether it's boats and people or just the, the people uh, adopting a more generous disposition than they did uh, pre-independence. Secondly, I think um, that higher profile does help, but the, you put your finger on the importance of a good constituency office. So if you're a local member of parliament, the quality of your electorate office is invaluable. It's just indispensable. But I can remember when I was a, a minister, I went to a local event, being the first event I'd been to for a while, whereas when you're a member of parliament, don't have ministerial responsibilities, you go all the time. And, you know, one old wag looked me in the eye and said, hi, Stephen, how are you going? Haven't seen you for a while. Um, we see you on the tally. Keep up the good work. So, you know, they, you can't get a trick past them. If they see you on the tally with your feet up at Bali having a good time, well, then they're going to mark you down. But if they see you doing good deeds, well, then they'll say, well, you know, he's our guy. My second, and, and I've got one minute, is why do you think, given that we share a tradition in cricket, why do you think Australian cricket players and supporters dislike Coley so much? Dislike? <laughs> So Virat Kohli's just had his 31st I think he's simply birthday. the most Australian of Indian cricketers. Well, exactly. Uh, <laughs> this is, this, and this so the Australians recognise themselves in this uh, fiercely, you know, uh, antagonistic, hard-working, hostile, aggressive, yeah. in-your-face yeah. kind of uh, no, Indian no, no. cricketer. It's, it's and so, so they say, hey, we can dish it out, we can't take it, exactly. so let's hate this well, guy instead. Well, this is... This is, this is This is precisely my own analysis, which is that Coley is disliked by the Australian cricket players because he plays cricket like an Australian. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's just from time to time, Australian cricket players can be boring and boorish, and Coley's got a bit of a land and wit about him. Um, anyway, the, the last test match against India played in Perth was played not at the Wacker, but at the new stadium. Uh, which is not a good venue for cricket. Anyway, when Coley was dismissed... Why is it... Because I too read about that and was it's, very curious. Look, it's a good... Why the shift happened? Uh, the shift happened for a whole range of reasons, in part because the WACA did... The, the West Australian Cricket Association didn't know how to turn itself into a cricket and a football stadium. Oh. So the revenue comes from football, not from, from cricket. So it's a tragedy. But you've got a, you've got a similar instance in... In Mumbai, I think, where the old, in Cochin, yes, where the old ground, which is a fantastic ground, no longer has the Test matches played. Oh there. no, the Mumbai had that. That's yeah. a different problem altogether. But that yeah. was purely an ego clash between the state government, which wanted more complimentary tickets than the Cricket yeah. Club of India, well, which owned the Brabant Stadium, was prepared to give them. Well, so that's not a good reason. No, no, Certainly no, not a precedent. Far, far be it from me to retail the history of the Wacker, but there was an element of that in previous oh, there was, administrations was there, right. as well. But that's by the by. Uh, the famously fast pitch of the Wacker, and yeah. now you've got a new stadium which uh, yeah. is, is well, less... It was a drop-in drop pitch with the same soil. But it's a football stadium, not a cricket stadium, so it has none of the, it has none of the character of the old of the Wacker or like the... I, I've often thought that the Wacker could have ended up being like Trent Bridge with, you know, sort of the apartments and the commercial offices around it to give it a, a, sustain, a sustainable future. And that was one of the plans which fell by the wayside. Pity. Anyway, we, we've now got to throw open to the audience and if we... There seems to we, be a mic here. If we... An extra mic. Is this a, for the a, audience? There's a roving... There's a roving mic. There's one roving mic already. Ro yep. You want a second roving mic? Okay. And I'm going to do my best to moderate. And it's... A, yep. It's a bit hard to see up the back, but I've got two in the front and I've got one right at the back. So I'll go first gentleman here, second gentleman there, then the gentleman up the back, and then I need a woman to get some diversity equity. Where's, where's, where's the hand up? There's one in the corner here. There's one in the corner there and there's one up the back. Okay. Great. So in the middle. Okay. Yep. Me? I mean, whoever has the mic should just go with it. It's okay. Okay. Uh, that's me. Uh, Shoshibai... Uh, my name is Vijay Kumar. I read your book, uh, Why I'm a Hindu, and I was so fascinated by it. But in the background, I always felt that uh, it was uh, Swami Vivekananda who was sort of dictating to you to write this book. Uh, can you sort of put more on it? <laughs> yeah, I, I was hugely inspired by Vivekananda since my school days, and, and my blood boiled whenever I saw the bad guys citing him in a very distorted way. Um, in the course of our contemporary politics. I should explain that uh, uh, traditionally Indian politicians have kept their religion aside from their public service and 
many of us practiced our own faiths privately but never talked about it in public. But suddenly we've had the rise of the current ruling party whose official credo is Hindutva, which is ostensibly in defense of Hinduism, but in practice is actually the promotion of identity politics, uh, very often distanced from the actual tenets of Hinduism. And the Hinduism that Vivekananda had preached uh, and that Mahatma Gandhi had preached and that many others, um, including many of the Hindus I knew around me, practiced and the Hinduism in which I'd grown up, uh, uh, had nothing, bore no relation at all to the dogmatic, narrow-minded, monolithic sort of view of Hinduism being perpetrated uh, or propagated by those in power today. And uh, suddenly I said, uh, there's a certain moral urgency uh, to offering a different view of Hinduism for all the Hindus in the country who don't see themselves in the Hindutva project. And perhaps there aren't enough of them, but they needed a voice anyway, and I thought I would give it. So why am a Hindu is an attempt very much. Uh, and there are a couple of very key things that I keep harping away at Vivekananda, which the, the people who claim to be inspired by Vivekananda and the ruling party are, are anxious to downplay. Uh, one of the most important statements was in his very first speech to the... Uh, the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, when he said, I'm proud to stand here and speak to you on behalf of a faith that has taught the world not just tolerance, but acceptance. And you know, that stuck in my head. I read it as a teenager, and I kept thinking about it for decades afterwards. Yeah. It was a ter terribly profound insight, because like everybody else who'd gone to school in India, we'd learned that tolerance was a virtue. A tolerant king was a good king, right? But when you really think about it, tolerance is at bottom a very patronizing idea. It says, I have the truth, you are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in your right to be wrong. <laughs> Whereas acceptance goes well beyond tolerance. Acceptance, which is what Swami Vivekananda says Hinduism is all about, says, I believe I have the truth, you believe you have the truth, I will respect your truth, please respect my truth. And to my mind, that has been one of the great strengths of Hinduism, both within the faith, where there are multiple forms of worship, and with other faiths, where we're perfectly happy to allow other people to practice their own the way they want. So that was essentially the kind of Hinduism uh, that Vivekananda had taught me. And since he did almost all his preaching in English and wrote in English, it wasn't difficult uh, for, for, for me to say that I had read the original sources, which is where one, one's on a, the liberal Hindu is on a weak wicket when people can spout Sanskrit back at them. But Vivekananda certainly... Uh, in the 1890s and the first few years of the 20th century were, were speaking and, and preaching in English and he was doing so to an international audience as well as a domestic one uh, in India. And to my mind, his lessons need to be revived today and that's, that's one of the reasons I was uh, uh, writing the book. It, it's, of course, not purely uh, a devotional work. It's also a skeptical work. It asks questions. Uh, there's a certain amount of distancing in commentary in the, in the, and there's also a certain amount of politics in the book Why I'm a Hindu. But it's available here in Australia, so those who've been, curiosity has been piqued by his question, should please go out and get it. Thank you. Okay. So the gentleman, yep, yep. next to him. Uh, and then we, I, and then we I come across, to sorry, sorry, we just, uh, sorry, next question to the woman over on the left, then we'll, then we'll get the bottom row done, then we can go at the back. So sorry, go ahead. Hi, Shashi, uh, my name is Shakti Singh, and I follow you on social media, Twitter, and I think. Thank you. On the tweet uh, in July that you, uh, you know, made a, the decision for the dual citizenship, you passed that, uh, I think, suggestion in the parliament. I don't know what exactly you call it. So I don't know that what it was. It was a private member's bill that I introduced in parliament. Uh, for the dual citizenship. Uh, calling for dual citizenship. Yeah. Being Thank you be so much for that, first of all. Uh, so it's what is the, what's happening right now? It, it's lapsed. It's lapsed because the Lok Sabha was dissolved uh, when the elections uh, were called. But the problem also is that... Um, that uh, there's a tremendous amount of resistance within the Indian government to the idea of dual citizenship. There is this old-fashioned belief that the passport you hold governs your loyalty. And I know many, many Indians who will sell their country for a bottle of scotch. And there are many Indians um, whose heart is in India even if they're carrying uh, a foreign passport. I mean, it's, 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 you really have to... If somebody wants to have allegiance to two countries, it seems to me... Um, we should be happy, we should, we should honor it and say, fair enough for your life and convenience, you're Australian today or are American or anything else, but uh, you want to be Indian and you're willing to make the effort to hold on to your passport, we will recognize that's, that's to my mind, um, what many, many civilized countries, including Australia, does. You can be Australian and something else, um, whereas in India you can't. 
but I, I found very little sympathy or support for my bill. Do you think when Congress will come back, maybe next term, it will happen? <laughs> <laughs> I think we, this is a very much an individual, a private member's bill being one individual member. Um, I think it would be a hard sell within the Congress too. I think though the Congress is proud of being a liberal party, uh, some of the attitudes I summarized uh, were held by people I knew in the Congress as well. Thanks I so remember much. a Congress sports minister. For example, there was a time when OCI cardholders could play for India in international sporting competition. So we once had a Davis Cup team that was made up entirely of people who had foreign passports but OCI, that is Overseas Citizenship of India cards. The Overseas Citizenship of India is not really a citizenship, it is merely a lifetime visa. But um, suddenly they were disallowed and uh, one of the players was uh, Prakash Amritraj of America, whose father Vijay is still an Indian citizen, is a friend of mine. And Vijay called me and said, this is such an injustice, well, well, can't you do something about it? And I was minister then, so I trotted over to the sports ministry and spoke to my friend, the Minister of State for Sports, uh, who, who had charge of that ministry. And he turned right around, he was an elderly gentleman, and said, if the two national anthems are played, which one will he stand up for? <laughs> you know, that was the, that kind of attitude is still very much there. Uh, and um, I'm afraid um, I couldn't get any traction on that, and the OCI players still remain disqualified. So uh, the BJP has come to pass since then. They've not changed that rule either. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but I believe in it, and I, I'm quite prepared to argue the case uh, should I have another opportunity to do so. Okay, uh, on the left. Uh, my name is Joan Arakal. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak because I'm a woman and not in spite of it. Um, as a Desi Indian who still, whose heart is still left behind in India, uh, Shashi, as, we, as you just mentioned, um, I'd just uh, like to say I have lived in Perth for over two decades. And I'm an Indian who straddles Indian and Australian um, sentiments. And it's interesting to see over the two decades how things have progressed from when I first came, where Indians were viewed with some derision, I must say, and some tolerance, so to speak. And uh, things have moved on uh, considerably. And in some sense, we have colonized the place with the so-called soft power, which is where I first came to know of you, uh, Dr. Tharoor. Um, and I greatly appreciate what you have done for the Indian diaspora, not only through your writings, but also through little snippets of uh, YouTubes, et cetera, which have actually highlighted the issues uh, that generally you know, has been associated with the problems of colonialism. So thank you very much for what you've done for the Indian diaspora, uh, whose, many of whose uh, hearts still reside uh, in India. You can take a woman out of India, but not India out of the woman, and that's me. And, uh, <laughs> on a different Hello. note, um, I appreciate that you belong to the opposition, and uh, I've heard your uh, gripe against the ruling party, but may I ask you that if you were to have been uh, within the ruling party, would that not have been better for not only the party, but also for your own uh, prospects? Okay. See, in the parliamentary system, you belong to a party um, because you share its, its values and principles. Um, I'm not saying I disagree with every single thing the BJP does in foreign policy, economic policy, other things. There might be areas I might be prepared to agree with them, but the fundamental core beliefs of the party, which sadly rest on a very narrow-minded and bigoted view of India as a Hindu Rashtra uh, is something that I find impossible to accept. And particularly, uh, having grown up all my life with this very pluralistic vision of India as a country which is a confluence of all sorts of ethnicities, religions, languages, you know, colors, cultures, all of that, um, I find it difficult to accept um, uh, a party which doesn't share that view, and I think they would logically find it difficult to accept me for that reason. So that's one of the reasons why I've not contemplated that option. I'm not suggesting my party is perfect. Every party has its own flaws, but these are different flaws. And I think that um, uh, in a country like ours, uh, you choose the option with which you are most comfortable. And for me, that has been um, the party that now is again in opposition. Uh, but I think I can do my bit to contribute to the country in, in all sorts of ways, including you're very kind to say uh, through my speeches and so on, which do seem to have an afterlife beyond the audience to whom they were initially addressed. And that, that gives me uh, such influence as I am able to command, and that's something that I'm very happy to have, do you, be able to do. Do you have any independents in the Lok Sabha? We have a small number in the House of Reps. 
Mm, not really. I think there are two, uh, neither of whom, frankly, counts for very much and who are there uh, in some ways as surrogates for uh, political uh, interests that had to prop them up. So, no, I wouldn't do that. And the other thing is that, in any case, we have this habit of, of allocating time according to the strength of your party. So, um, if you want to participate in any meaningful debates, as an independent, you'd get two minutes. It just You would not be able to make any impact with, with the time you had in Parliament. Now, we're, we are compressed with time. Oh. I'm going to go to the woman in I the middle who's got the mic, and then I'll go to the gentleman up the back. So one I'll go question. No, it's just woman in the middle, and then I'll go to you as the last question. So I have a couple of questions, sorry. One is... Um, I'm not sure where you are, ma'am. I shall stand up. Oh, thanks. Yeah, okay. Is there anything you like about Manmohan? I'm um, sorry, not Manmohan. Modi. Is there any one thing that you can say to us which you appreciate about him? Yep. And the other question I have is, the Congress party is clearly still living in the era of the Nehru dynasty. Um, isn't it time to give up and just get some true leaders coming out? Because when I watch Rahul, I just get a bit annoyed. Um, I mean, both are questions, uh, as you can imagine, that, that many fair-minded people ask. And I, I'll respond in that spirit on the first one. Yes, sir, there are a couple of things I like about Mr. Modi. One is the enormous amount of energy and commitment he brings to his work. I think he's one of the most tireless uh, political leaders I've seen at close quarters. He's um, uh, amazing in, his, in the hours he puts in. He's running around the world. He'll step right off a plane and, and go straight into meetings. There's that tremendous dynamism and energy that he's brought uh, uh, to, to governance, which I welcome. And the second thing is that there are very many things about his larger economic vision and ideas for using the bully pulpit, as Theodore Roosevelt called the presidency in America, that is a, a, a platform from which you can set the nation's agenda. And that he's done amazingly well, and better than perhaps some of his predecessors, with the exception, of course, of Nehru, who did do the same thing in that he used the prime ministership to lay out a vision for India. That's, uh, that's been pretty good with Modi, and on a number of issues, he's been able to use that platform to, to sell new ideas. But, uh, unfortunately, his diagnosis has not always been matched with an effective prescription. So I can, I can really admire his diagnostic skills and figuring out what the country needs, uh, but I honestly can't admire uh, the specific policies he's chosen to pursue to, to fulfill them. Uh, indeed, there's a very often a disconnection between the policies and the vision articulated, and the way in which they've been implemented has been very disappointing. Uh, there's a leaked story in the papers a couple of days ago in which he is alleged to have said to uh, a large gathering of senior bureaucrats uh, that you destroyed my first term and I won't let you do it again, which means he's acknowledging, at least privately, uh, that uh, his first term was indeed uh, an absolute uh, failure. I mean, he... Aap logo ne mere paanch saal ko barbaad kar diya aur main to agli baar, is baar aapko... That was a statement that was quoted in the papers yesterday. So it's very striking that there is this feeling, even on, on, on uh, his own part, the admission that he hasn't got the results to show for the visions he's articulated. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Tharoor, up the back. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, uh, I've read all your books and a big fan of your writing. My question is to Dr. Tharoor, the parliamentarian, the MP of Congress party from Thiruvananthapuram. You said that you are disappointed that India did not sign up with RCEP, but your party president has claimed credit for forcing Mr. Modi not to sign it. How do you reconcile that? No, no. I, uh, first of all, I didn't answer the lady's second question, for which I apologize, which is that, you know, in every party, we have our own processes to elect a leadership, and there is no forum in which uh, an alternative leadership can magically emerge. But were an election to be convened, uh, to be called amongst party workers. I think none of us doubts that almost any member of the Gandhi family would crush any other Congress leader you could care to name in a vote amongst Congress workers. So every party is led by the people the workers want, and that's, that's what the, the, the Congress party's reality is. But coming back to your thing, you know, I've um, been careful not to say anything until the decision was taken precisely because I didn't agree with my, with my party's position. Now that it's clear that the, uh, the, the whole... Uh, exercise is over, um, I, can, uh, I, can, I can sort of take on this commentator's or observer's view and say that um, uh, as an outside um, commentator, if I weren't 
uh, in a political party or in parliament, uh, I would have allowed myself the luxury of arguing the case for looking at the longer term benefits, uh, looking at, there's undoubtedly short term costs. And as I said, uh, in answering Stephen's question earlier, I said that every politician in a democracy thinks in the short term. There will be people uh, whose businesses will be in trouble. There will be dairy farmers who will have New Zealand competition. There'll be smaller manufacturers who'll have Chinese competition. All sorts of things will happen uh, that in the short term will do damage, but in the longer term, it will give India opportunities abroad. It will bring in investment from each of these economies where India has advantages to offer of both scale and labor. Uh, it, 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 in the longer term, would undoubtedly have been good for the Indian economy and also for India's overall geopolitical strategies in the region. Um, but in the end, um, uh, both the opposition and the government preferred to focus on the short term, and I don't blame them. They have elections to fight, I have elections to fight. Uh, and if I were to fight an election on a pro rcep platform in four years' time, it's quite likely that, that I could lose for that reason because there wouldn't be enough tangible benefits yet to show. So these are some of the considerations. But I was making a, a, a semi-philosophical observation to Stephen that the truth is that we have voted our fears. We have not voted our longer-term aspirations. Well, um, we've caught up our five minutes and more. I'm going to be very naughty and say you don't have to respond to this as a commentator or generally. I've met Raoul on a number of occasions. And the impression I've always had is that his heart's really not in it. He's being asked to do a job that he doesn't want to do. I think some of us have warned him about that perception and the need to shake it off. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for attending. And please give Shashi a tremendous uh, vote of thanks. And Stephen. Thank you. There'll be a very short break. The next, the next session is actually due to start at 12. However, if you're interested in purchasing Dr. Taro's books, they are available and he will be available to sign them as well. Thank you. Just outside, yep.